Content coverage of large numbers of objectives superficially means that we end up reteaching the same thing over and over again year after year because we didn't stop and do it well and deeply uh, at a moment in time. So our kids study fractions in third grade and they, then again in fourth grade and fifth grade. Many of them don't get it. They're back at it in sixth and seventh and there are high school students who still haven't managed, you know, mastered fractions. Whereas um, if we spent, uh, as many countries do, a quarter of a year on a single topic, working on it deeply, you could then understand it deeply enough to move forward. And I think this accounts for the low achievement that we see in part in this country relative to other countries. A lot of our curriculum and testing system is focused on the past. Do we or do we not focus too much on testing? We focus way more on testing than any country in the world. Uh, if it moves, we test it. Is that true? More That's than anybody true. else does? We do. Every child every year in grades three through eight, plus at least one year in high school, many states like California, um, kids will take 32 tests before they get to the SAT, the ACT, you know, the International Baccalaureate, the AP, all of that. Um, we are the most tested and the least examined kids in the world. Science is disappearing from American classrooms. Uh, under No Child Left Behind, with reading and math scores driving the accountability system, in low-income schools, um, science is barely taught at all. And in many schools, when it's taught, it's taught as a list of facts to be memorized from a textbook uh, and then regurgitated on a multiple choice test. Not as a process of inquiry and investigation, uh, not as a way of understanding and evaluating and learning about the world that you could actually take and apply in the world outside of school. The problem with No Child Left Behind was not the intentions, very noble intentions, to pay attention to all s groups of students, uh, aim for closing the achievement gap, uh, and try to encourage schools to meet, you know, continuous improvement targets. But the vehicle that was chosen, which was every child every year multiple choice testing, ended up narrowing and dumbing down the curriculum. Uh, there was much too little attention paid to the capacity building needed, so testing without investing doesn't get you all that far. It did not address the inequalities in funding, the inequalities in access to qualified teachers, and so on. Uh, so while I do think it produced a, an agreement in the country that we should be paying attention to the achievement of all students uh, and that we should be um, uh, deliberately working to close the achievement gap, we are now at a point where alternatives are obviously needed. I'd like to just start with a quote from a colleague of mine, Adam Urbanski, who is the president of the Rochester Federation of Teachers. And he just, I think, nailed uh, something that is very important for us to think about. Because in many societies, the idea of excellence and the idea of equity are framed as though they are in opposition to each other. Uh, you can have excellence or you can have equity. And he put it this way. Excellence and equity are not opposing concepts. The definitions of the words include each other. Excellence without equity is simply not excellence, it is privilege. Excellence is superlative performance starting from a level playing field, performance made superlative through extraordinary effort and talent, not from the relative advantage of some at the expense of others. True excellence requires equity as a precondition. And he went on to say, and equity without excellence is not equity. It is tokenism and leads to a mediocrity that is good for no one's kids. Equity means we push every one of our students to excellence and tell them in no uncertain terms, we will support you along the way, no matter who your parents are, where they may have been born, the color of your skin, where you live, how much money your parents make, the structure of your family, your prior academic performance, or even how long you have been in the district. You are ours and we will support you. And the fundamental idea that all of the children are ours is the idea that I think societies have to grapple with. Uh, when 
education is conceptualized as a private good. I got mine, you know, see if you can get yours. If you can't, sorry for you, it doesn't affect me. It really doesn't work in today's societies uh, because we're all identified with one another. So in the United States, I'm a member of the baby boom generation, and I think some of you might join me <laughs> in that. Um, and so our health care, our Social Security for this enormous graying uh, generation is entirely dependent on whether every one of the young people in the economy can get a good job that pays good wages and they can pay taxes. If we, the people of the United States, do not do something and do something fairly quickly, what are the consequences for us? Well, if we don't uh, create a, a higher quality system for all kids, we do well with some kids, but we have great inequality, uh, we're going to continue to become, as the New York Times said some months ago, a prison nation. We've got one in a hundred people incarcerated. We can't afford our health care system. We can't afford our social security system unless every single person in this country is prepared to get a good job in the knowledge economy that we're in today. Education is not a private good, it's a public good. What that means is that we all benefit and we all hurt depending on the quality of education other people's kids get. Uh -huh. What happens as a result? Well, we're building now a school to prison pipeline. Uh, we've got, uh, we've quadrupled the number of young people in prison. Uh, we are spending 900% more on corrections than we were 30 years ago, while our public school dollars have gone up much less. What that means is that you as a taxpayer are paying in California almost $50,000 a year on inmates that you wouldn't spend $10,000 a year to get educated so that they would be able to get a good job. Most inmates are high school dropouts and most are functionally illiterate. So it's really an education problem and I don't want to be paying taxes uh, for you know the results of a kid not having gotten a great teacher to teach him to read in third grade. And this is, you know, we would like societies to be motivated by what's right and what's appropriate for the welfare and the potential of every human. But if societies do not understand their own self-interest um, and the fact that you are ours, every child is ours and we must support you, uh, those societies will fail. And the United States is really at the brink of either figuring this out and making a radical U-turn in its education policies uh, or uh, entering into a decline that you know, will probably replicate the fall of Rome. Do you still come across stories in the U.S. in particular states, particular districts, where in fact the opposite happens, that teachers pretty much are left alone in the classroom and they're doing the best they can, uh, but often on the basis of some knowledge but a lot of intuition. Absolutely. We have states that are, have pursued a professional agenda and have done all the things I just described. We have states that have done very little of it or have even undone it after they got started. Uh, and so we have places where people come into teaching all different ways. Some people have training, some people don't. They may or may not be prepared in their content area. They may or may not know anything about how to teach it effectively. Uh, we have districts where there's very little professional learning opportunity and where the standards for entry and continuation are not very well enforced. And where you have that set of conditions, you typically have pretty low achievement and big achievement gaps. Mm -hmm. More money to the children of the rich, less money to the children of the poor. That leads to inequitable distribution of well-qualified educators because salaries are different, working conditions are different. There's not actually a, an overall shortage of teachers, but there is a shortage of teachers willing to work for low wages under bad working conditions. <laughs> Why should we care what's happened there? 
Well, I think we need to care about what's happened in a lot of places that have turned their education systems around in the last 30 or 40 years. We used to be number one in the 1970s, hands down, the U.S. education system. And we've been sort of peddling in place while other nations have been putting together um, a 21st century system. So we need to understand uh, what Finland, Singapore, Korea, and some other countries have done. Well, looking at Finland in particular, but drawing your knowledge of places like South Korea, Singapore, Canada, and Australia, what one thing stands out in your mind is common? Well, I actually see two or three things in common. <laughs> one is that they do all have this equitable level playing field. They invest in schools equitably. But number two, they all require that teachers be very highly selected and very well prepared. Teaching is rocket science. It is really hard to teach all kids well, given the range of the kind of intellectual demands, the kinds of diversity that we have. Uh, so teachers really need the kind of education that will allow them to be successful. And they do that across the board. Um, whereas we do it unequally. We have some great training and some lousy training and you know, people kind of find their way through. And the third thing they do is they organize the curriculum today around what we think of as 21st century skills. Critical thinking, problem solving, analysis, synthesis, the ability to research things and learn to learn and put things together in addition to the traditional content area subjects. And their assessments are open-ended, uh, project-based. They don't use multiple choice tests. Uh, they expect people to be able to put their ideas out there and defend their ideas and use evidence and solve complex problems. If you were to become a teacher in Finland, uh, Singapore, Korea, you would come in, you would be selected from the highest achieving members of the high school or college class. You would have, depending on the country, anywhere from two to four years of preparation to teach, completely paid for by the government, with a salary or a stipend while you train. You would then go into a school and get uh, mentoring that is established from very well-trained and well-qualified mentors who are um, uh, there to be sure that you learn to teach effectively. And then you would have, in most cases, um, 15 to 25 hours a week to plan with your fellow teachers, to do action research, lesson study, to, you know, learn to make sure that all of your lessons are high quality lessons. If you're a U.S. teacher, you will get almost no uh, support to go into teaching uh, financially. Um, you will have to go into debt to go into an occupation that pays 60% of what other college graduates earn, whereas, again, in other countries, it's more equivalent to other college graduates. Um, you will come into a field where you might get a little help when you enter or you might not. It's kind of variable. Um, and you will have three hours a week for individual planning in most schools and no time to work with your colleagues to improve your craft. So the differentials in the ways in which teaching is supported are very different. That when they get in the classroom, what they do is very, very well thought through and informed by what a lot of other teachers are doing. Most high-achieving countries pay teachers about equivalently to engineers, so they're a bit better paid than U.S. teachers. But it is not the pay that draws people into um, those professions and to stay there. Uh, when teachers are treated professionally, when they feel they have a lot of opportunity to shape the curriculum, work with their colleagues, develop high-quality practice, um, the morale is very, very high. And then their assessments are open-ended. There are many fewer of them. Typically, most countries do not assess students more than about once or twice before high school. Uh, and then they may have high school examinations, typically predominantly or exclusively open-ended essays and projects and problem sets, which engage students in everything from uh, analyzing information, uh, conducting scientific investigations and writing them up, really preparing for college and careers. 
In the classrooms, the teachers then do a lot of work around project-based learning. Uh, you would often in a classroom see students working on a lot of self-initiated work, individually and in small groups. They may be creating a student newspaper and working on their journalism project. Uh, they may be designing and conducting scientific investigations. Uh, when they're studying what a fish looks like, they actually will go out and get 30 fish and one on each desk and dissect the fish and figure out how it operates and so on. Uh, you'll see uh, a lot of investigation and inquiry in every field. That's really their hallmark is to create a nation of inquiring minds. And they also believe that it's very important for students to reflect on what they've done, what they've learned, and be able to improve on it themselves. Another vivid example would be Singapore. A group of students I saw who were trying to develop a natural skin treatment to keep mosquitoes away without using artificial products. And they had developed five different products and evaluated them and so on. They know how to design an experiment. They know how to conduct it to evaluate their results to then improve on what they've done. Uh, this is widespread. So one of the things that's very interesting, there's a lot of emphasis on music, a foreign language. In Finland and many other countries, kids are learning three foreign languages. They're learning at least three languages in elementary school when their brains are, you know, very open to learning language. Well, all of those things that they're doing are building the cognitive muscle. They're building the way that the brain works to be able to do other things. So what we know about people who have a lot of musical training, you'll see this in a lot of Asian countries too, is that the patterns they're learning in music translate over to math. And when they're learning languages, the mental flexibility that they're gaining is allowing them to use their native language much more prolifically and to learn a variety of other things more easily. So these things that we think of as frills are at the core of building an active, able mind that not only can enjoy other people and communicate and, and have artistic abilities, but also can do the core subjects uh, in more flexible ways. Our top ranking state on every measure, and that's Massachusetts. Now, Massachusetts has a pretty highly educated population, but it was not always at the head of the pack in terms of educational performance. Uh, in the early 1990s, they put in place a school funding reform that allocated more money to follow the child with more money for children in poverty, uh, English learners, and others who needed more uh, support. They enacted standards that were very thoughtful, not unlike the kind of standards reflected in the new national curriculum in Australia. Uh, they followed that up with very thoughtful, open-ended assessments, not just multiple choice fill in the bubble. They uh, invested in preschool across the whole state, uh, child health, and professional development for teachers and school administrators. Uh, they very quickly rose to be one of the highest performing states because they did a systemic approach. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in other countries, Singapore, Finland, In 1900, the U.S. public school system was being formulated in the way that it exists today, during the Industrial Revolution. 5% uh, of jobs required specialized knowledge and skills. By 2000, 70% of jobs required specialized knowledge and skills beyond high school. It's even higher than that today. So we're at a point where we have to educate most people for the level of knowledge and skill that we used to educate only a very small proportion. We used to cream off a few students for thinking work. Uh, they were in uh, tra higher tracks, advanced placement uh, courses, honors courses. Uh, that level of education is now needed by most students. We need to do several things, I think, in most people's minds. One is to really return to a robust, intellectually challenging curriculum, not a multiple choice curriculum that is just very focused on low level skills. Uh, we've got to address the equity issue in terms of the resources and we've got to uh, continue to build more assertively professional capacity to do the work because standards do not teach themselves. 
Uh, and we will see that. I mean, there's definitely that conversation in Australia. Clearly, it's been learned in the United States. Words on paper are nice. Uh, they can make you think about what you might do. But if you don't know how to do it, you don't have the resources to do it, and you haven't organized the schools to do it, they won't get you far enough. Then we need to really deal with this poverty issue with the kinds of things that can make a huge difference. There's one final study I'll mention to you that Johns Hopkins did, which looked at the difference between rich and poor kids at ninth grade and said, what accounts for the difference in achievement? A third of it was present at kindergarten. The differences in what kids got access to before they got to school. Two thirds of it was caused by summer learning loss. Because rich kids go to wonderful camps and get uh, gain in achievement all summer, or they read and read and read. And low income kids typically lose achievement in the summer. And now that we no longer have summer programs that we used to have in the 60s and 70s, there's very little for them to do. So basically schools are about the same rate during the school year. In fact, low-income kids improve a little bit more than uh, rich kids. But you have a gap at the beginning, and every summer it gets bigger. So we need preschool, we need summer learning, and we need wraparound services. These are all things that were planted in the American education policy landscape in the 1970s um, and that have not been tended in recent years to expand and to grow, except in a few places. So what about teacher evaluation? Because this comes to the topic of your lecture at the University of Melbourne this week. What, what is effective? Well, number one, you need good assessment in pre-service and at the end of pre-service before you enter. You can't wait till people get into the occupation and say, now we'll sort out whether you know what to do. The strong professions, medicine, law, um, engineering, and so on, uh, have strong assessment before you get in the profession. Uh, and so uh, there should be uh, evaluation of preparation programs and what they do and what they're producing. There should be evaluation of beginning teachers before they enter, uh, sort of like we would think of as a bar exam in the law or a medical uh, licensing exam. Uh, we use in the United States now, many states, uh, started with California where I am, a performance assessment for beginning teachers where they actually demonstrate that they can plan and teach a curriculum and produce student learning and evaluate that learning and they put it in a portfolio and it gets assessed by trained evaluators and that's very transformative for the candidates and the preparation institutions. Then you have to think about evaluation when you get into the occupation and there you need uh, both uh, standards-based observations uh, of the practice, what's going on in the classroom, what the plans and student work look like, and all of those things. And you need to uh, begin to assemble thoughtful evidence of student learning that goes along with the evidence of practice. So in the best cases, teachers are assembling a portfolio of evidence about what their kids have learned over time, from the beginning to the end of the year or the beginning to the end of the unit as well as what they themselves are doing to encourage that uh, learning, to give the right kind of feedback, to put the right kind of instructional strategies in place. Where you have that happening in a developmental way, mm. where the accountability is explicitly about improvement, uh, you see tremendous uh, school-wide improvements, uh, particularly if teachers are talking about and helping each other figure out how to uh, improve their practice together and develop evidence of learning together and look at that evidence together. One thing about the expectations for students is that um, the most important skill for them is going to be learning to learn. And I sometimes tell a little story which I, um, as a Stanford professor, feel a little guilty about because it's um, research done by Berkeley people, but uh, and that's our big rival. But there are some people looking there at the growth of knowledge in the world. And they found that between 1999 and 2003, there was more new knowledge created in the world than in the entire history of the world preceding. You think about that. Mm. Technology knowledge is doubling every year at this point. Uh, it's not going to be enough to say, here's a set of facts. Memorize the facts, spit them back to me, divide them up into the 12 years of schooling. You, you know, you've done that, and then you're done. The, young people we have are going to have to solve problems that we uh, have created for them and can barely frame with knowledge that hasn't been invented yet 
technologies that haven't been discovered yet, um, they're going to have to be able to take what they know and continually acquire, evaluate, use new knowledge, and invent new things. That means we're not doing, we cannot do a transmission curriculum, which just says, okay, you know, people learned this a long time ago, we're telling it to you, you're gonna remember it and tell it back to us. We have to teach them to be able to work uh, in the world on acquiring and making sense of and inventing and being creative. So that's a huge shift in the expectations for schools. It also means we need teachers and school leaders who themselves can think in those ways mm -hmm. uh, and can teach a curriculum in a way that uh, allows kids to do a lot of inquiry while they're learning the facts and concepts mm -hmm. Uh, so that that habit of inquiry, that habit of thinking creatively and uh, discovering and making sense of and so on is so deeply ingrained that the, ch the students that we have today uh, greatly exceed us in their capacity for problem solving. 